to leave enough time for you. We'll make sure to leave time for questions for Stacy too. Love it. Everybody just popping in here like popcorn. <laughs> Good yes. morning. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Bethany. Glenn. How are you guys doing? Christopher, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so excited. I'm stoked for this morning. You guys have no idea how excited I am to have Stacy here today. I am, oh, my heart is overjoyed. Makes my heart happy. Just so you guys know, Stacy's my sister from another mother. <laughs> we might be twins in another world, I think. <laughs> yes. I agree. I think so. <laughs> Everybody Our loves Stacy, right? Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yes. All right, Megan. Good morning, Russell. Good morning, Matthew. I love it. All right. Well, we'll let everybody keep popping in here. And as everybody is uh, joining us, I'm going to go ahead and get us started because it is 9.02 and I do not want to waste a minute of time while we've got Stacy in the house. Uh, so I want to start with, if you guys don't know Stacy, she's been in the real estate business for 20 plus years, right? So her knowledge is phenomenal. Uh, been through a couple different types of markets. Um, she uh, built a team to over 300 transactions a year. She sold that team for a seven-figure valuation. She's got 600 plus people in her organization within EXP and is an integral part of real estate B-School, which I am proud to be a part of. Stacy is my personal coach. So um, I am really stoked to have her here. She holds a very special place in my heart. And she's gonna be talking about leverage today, you guys. How many of you guys ever get told, you need to delegate more, or you need to learn how to leverage more, or you'd be more efficient? Yes, well, Stacy is gonna rock the house with some leverage discussion. So Stacy. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thanks for the uh, introduction. And I see so many faces on here that I know. Randy, Matt, Tom, of course, Andrea. Um, and there's probably, other, I can't see everybody uh, on my screen. So I am honored that you guys asked me to come and speak to you about leverage. Leverage, if there was like a true love language of business mine would be leverage systems automation like i swear from the beginning like <clears throat> i organized my barbie clothes in a certain way to have a system and like how they were organized <laughs> and so it's just kind of how it, but with that said i'm not actually a super organized person on a lot of things so that speaks to systems so if I can get other people to run the system that I can take something complex and bring it down to something simple, um, that, that's really where I shine. It's not truly running the systems myself. So, um, but today, just kind of talking through, Andrea and I started this conversation about leverage because in real estate as agents, a lot of times we are like a one man show. We have so many things happening. We're trying to handle it all or we're trying to coordinate it all. And like, what happens? We either stall our business because we're too busy. So we didn't have time to attract more clients. Maybe our conversion is now terrible. Our pipelines dried up. Um, maybe we sabotage our business. So we stop doing the things that actually work or maybe we sell our business, meaning quit burnout, you could sell, but most likely not, right? And so leverage is, this is how Andrea and I started this conversation, is we both are reading or read this book called Buy Back Your Time by Dan Martell. Has anybody read that? Okay, put it on your list. Like, I, I listen to a lot of books, I read a lot of books, um, but this one is, I think, if you truly want to build a business, he speaks in those terms, but he doesn't speak like above your head, if that makes sense. You've all heard you need to have people, right? Who, not how. You need to delegate to elevate, like all the fun things that we talk about. But he really put it in um, sort of an easy way. And so I'm going to talk today how to use it for your business, because um, these are all things that we've all heard, but maybe we don't know exactly 
how to get that leverage. Maybe we don't know exactly who to hire. Maybe we don't know exactly where we're spending our time and why we need to understand that and how much money we're spending, right? Like all these things that we're responsible for in our business sometimes just gets overlooked because it's a lot, right? We have to sell homes. We have to make sure they close. We have to be the home inspector half the time. We have to be the, you know, therapist. We have to be the gift giver. We have to like be a photographer. So this is going to teach us how to buy back our time. So the premise of this buy back your time is not buying back your time to grow your business. It's buying back our time because our calendar is at overcapacity. And so buying back our time allows us to do the things we need to for us to stay in our business and not get burnt out and ultimately will help us grow. But how many of you have ever maybe freed up some of your time by, let's say you have someone handling your contract to close and then you're like, hmm, what do I do with that time now? Because maybe you are really involved in it, right? So we're like, uh, now that I got some time, I guess I'm not even sure what I should do with it. So we're going to talk about that today. Like how do you decide what to do with your time that makes sense? And you didn't just like add some more busy work to your schedule. So there is this um, framework called the buyback loop. And he talks about it in this book. A lot of people talk about it just in terms of productivity and time management. And so what the buyback loop is, is it's basically a framework in which to understand why you are feeling overwhelmed at home, business, life, relationships. It could be any of those things. This actually works for any of it. And this loop or this, this buyback loop is something that you need to do more than once a year. It's. It's those times when you really are feeling that like uneasiness, maybe it's that anxiety, maybe it's I don't have enough deals coming in, it's holiday season, I know it's going to slow down, the mortgage rate, NAR, Zillow bot, follow-up boss, like whatever's going through your head, doing this will help give you that framework and a way to focus. So the first one, the, the three steps of the loop are audit, yes, too many loose ends, audit, transfer and fill. So we'll go through each of those. Audit is doing a time and energy audit. So when you look at your business, you're looking at it from a cost perspective and you're looking at it from an energy perspective, right? Because things may not cost us very much in terms of money, but in terms of energy and, you know, it just might wipe us out. Like if your strong suit isn't um, prospecting, then sometimes prospecting burns us out. Now, am I saying go get somebody to do that for you? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying you're taking an audit on what lights you up and what doesn't. So there's, you've probably heard of this in terms of like a time study, write down everything for 15 minutes. You may have heard um, this one where you take a piece of paper, you split it in half. I think this one's really easy, but you split it in half. You have $20 on one side, 200 on the other. And you just write down during the day, what's the $20 item or less dollar per hour that you did and what's 200 and over. And the more you're in the 200, right, the more you're running your business like a true business. So the time and energy audit, how he explains to do it is you write everything down and you circle in green what lights you up and in red what doesn't. Then you go in and you put in a dollar sign. And this is what it's going to cost you to have someone else do it. So it's $1 sign to $4 signs, you know, kind of like when you're booking a restaurant on open door and it like gives you the dollar signs, right? It's like, is it high end or is it, you know, affordable, right? So kind of same thing. So when you're doing your energy audit, you're looking, now you have this visual, this visual showing you, Hey, it's okay that I don't love everything that I have to do in my business every day of my life. That's actually not the goal. The goal is to understand what's my unique ability. What am I really great at that I can do more often? And that's where I'm going to buy back my time, right? What can I do that makes me fulfilled more often instead of busying myself in all the stuff that probably is causing me burnout? So you do this for two weeks 
And once you get all of those red ones and the lower dollar, this is your hit list. So if, if sometimes your first question is, what do I delegate first? Who do I hire? What do I do? This is your list. And who knows your business better than you? You. Nobody knows it better than you. So you're looking at this list and now you see this and you may not be able to hire or automate or create a system around all of it like this, right? It's going to take some time, but you've got a complete focused list on what's not working for you. And now you have a complete focused list like this, like this dream goal of, can you imagine if I spent my day doing these green things with the $4 signs on them? Amazing. So that's the first part of it. It's the audit. So you're looking at it like who else could do this work? What system do I need? Is there an automation I already have that I can just tweak that can some of this stuff could happen on its own? Um, or this is my next hire, right? That list is literally what you're going to look for in your next hire. So can they go through my email? Can they go through my calendar? Um, can they... Uh, schedule showings for me or go into showing time and pull reports? Can they do a listing inventory balance sheet? Can they run my um, expenses just from a receipt folder in my email? Like that's your hire. So now you have a job description, right? Because you've got this list. So it works out great. Number two is transfer. So you may have been thinking in your head, like, how do I actually train somebody to do all this? Like if, yeah, if I had three weeks to sit around and train somebody, Stacey, that would be amazing. And I agree. I think that, I mean, that would be great too, right? But we don't, we don't. We have these little nooks that we can train people because we're busy. We have to sell homes. And so how you do this is called the camcorder method. And Andrea is actually doing this right now, like at a high level. So you have questions on it? Andrea's got it down. So the camcorder method is where just this, you open up a Zoom, but you don't have your admin on it, but you're going to do it. So let's say it's email, okay? So you're gonna start going through your email. You're gonna create the five folders that you want for someone else to go through your email, put them in those folders and take care of this business. So, okay, you're gonna record that. You're gonna talk to yourself. So you're looking at your email. You're like, okay, um, let's see. I got an email from Todd. Um, I don't even know who Todd is. Let me search. Have I done business with this guy before? Uh, nope, doesn't look like it. Okay, it goes in the folder, whatever you named it or however you want that handled. You're gonna do this three to five times. You're gonna record yourself and talk through it. Then you give it to your new admin, your VA, your whoever is gonna handle it. And you have them write the standard operating procedure or the playbook. Because now you understand if they actually know how to do it. This is the feedback loop. So if after five trainings, they don't know how to do it, either you're not clear on what you want, you change things, or maybe they're not going to be the right fit for you because you've put in the time. This also is called net time, which means you spent no money or time doing this because somebody had to go through the email anyway, and it's automatic training in the future. So it actually costs you zero to train this way. So now instead of taking off three weeks, costing you thousands and thousands of dollars in the long run, this is evergreen. This is something that's going to work continuously. If they have questions, they go back to the training instead of bothering you. So transfer is like one of my favorite things and considering it net time, no extra time. Okay. Number three is fill. So now when you look at it, what we're doing is we're looking to transfer you know, we, we transferred what we needed to somebody else. Now we need to fill that time, right? So what are we going to do with our time? So we're going to look at it one of two ways. We're going to look at it either in skills or belief. So do I need to understand how to do something? Do I need a coach? Do I need to read more books? Do I need to learn how to convert better? Do I need to know how to scale my business now? So I need to track finances? Like, What's the next skill needed now that I freed up my time on these things or mindset? Maybe it is. Okay. Now I have to become a leader because now I have people under me or someone, or um, I need to now pay for this person. So I have to make sure more business is coming in. So now you're transferring your skill 
or grabbing more skills and grabbing more beliefs or relationships. So like I mentioned, a coach, or maybe you need to network differently. So you get more leads, so your pipeline is full, you know, just examples, but it's going to be around skills, um, beliefs and relationships. So that's what we're doing when we are on the third part of it, which is fill. So let me slow down for one second because I get I get real excited about this. So are there any questions so far on what we've kind of went over or even any ahas? Is anyone like, man, this makes sense now or this helps me see it better? So there was a question in the chat about, so do you do it on a Zoom or do you just record it on your phone? Great question. You want to do it on a Zoom or Loom or something with a video because you want them to physically see what you're doing for with email, for instance. Now, if you're talking through scripts, you wouldn't necessarily have to be on a Zoom. You could do that on some type of audio recording. But what we're trying to do is also build a video bank library. So we've got a video library and we've got a standard operating procedure document library. And the reason we're doing these in like smaller snippets, right? So I didn't say, um, you know, show them how to do email, show them how to write a contract, show them how to close out that contract and sky slope in one video section. Nope. We're taking, you know, one task or piece of task and videoing it because that way, if like in my scenario, sky slope change, you're not like, oh crap, now I got to reshoot this hour long video. No. You just had one on email, you had one on listing procedures in Skyslope, you had one on closing procedures in Skyslope, like whatever it is. But you want them micro and you want to do it on Zoom. Cool, thank you. Yeah, good question. Anybody else got a question so far? If not, we'll keep going, it's no problem. Oh yeah, you can leverage uh, deeper by having AI create the SOP from your recording. Oh my gosh, right? Like endless, that's, I love that because that's true automation, right? <laughs> that's like that's like the goal. Okay, so let's talk about four types of leverage. So the reason that we use leverage or want leverage in our business and life is because you can't create more time, but leverage allows you to give more output. So that's why we're looking for leverage in our day, you know, anything we do, right? And leverage sometimes gets a bad name because it's like, oh, you're just giving to someone with some what you don't want to do. Well, I don't want to really clean my house, but I don't feel bad that I had a house cleaner to do it because she loves it. Like I'm giving her an opportunity to do what she loves. I don't love it at all. Like I'm not even close to it. So look at leverage like you're creating opportunities for others and yourself, right? Because now we're, again, getting that time back. And that's what that's that's what this is all about. So four types of leverage um, is number one is content, two is code, three is capital, and four is collaboration. And let me explain those. So content, right? We are all in a business where we are attracting people to us whether that be in some form of like a passive residual income, it could be to our, um, just our real estate business. It could be buyers and sellers so they can find us so they know we're an option. So content is exactly what it sounds like, right? You're putting out their videos, posts, um, your marketing properties, that's content because that is evergreen. And so content is a type of leverage because you put it out there and it's stays out there, right? Except if you're just doing stories or something snap that, that gets rid of it in 24 hours. I'm talking about true content. You're adding value or marketing something that's staying out there, okay? That's your first type of leverage. Your second type of leverage is code. And code in our business is systems and automation. In other businesses, it could be like software, right? That's kind of what we think uh, with, with code. Here's an easy example, a CRM. Okay, so if you're using KB Core or Follow Up Boss or um, Boomtown, whatever you're using, that is your code. So how can you make that code work super efficient for you, right? So you've got everybody on drip campaigns, you've got them on hot nurture watch tags, you know who to call, 
you've got all your past clients set up on an automated um, property review every month, like everything possible that a CRM could do that's beneficial to your business is another type of leverage. Number three is capital. And that's just investing money in order to grow. So that could be hiring someone. It could be um, purchasing a system. It could be coach, coaching, right? You're, you're investing capital in order to grow more. Then the last one is collaboration, which is people. So like this room that you're in, you're around, all of you have something that you do really great in the real estate space. And this is all about collaboration. That's why you have these meetings. And so using this and gleaning from it and adding value yourself is another type of leverage. We didn't have to drive to everybody's, like I'm not even in, you guys aren't all in the same state and I'm nowhere near you. So like we, I didn't have to drive to come meet with you, right? This collaboration happens because you're a community of giving. And so you want to take advantage of that and add value yourselves, invite, I don't know, I think you guys can invite people to this call, like all of those things, right? Like utilize what's in front of you. That's additional leverage. You don't even have to read this book after that. This is leverage, right? Because I'm giving, I'm giving you the cliff notes here. Okay. Now, after you've bought back some of your time, we want to talk about the replacement ladder. So one of the questions I get fairly often talking to agents is, who should I hire first? Or who should I hire next? What should I do? And so remember, we talked about that um, basically like a job description because you've got the red circles and the dollar signs and that's part of your job description of what, what's needed next. That would be, there's, there's five types of people in your replacement ladder, okay? And the first one is an executive assistant, okay? That executive assistant is gonna take that office stuff off of you. So it's gonna be, you know, we talked about an email inbox, calendar, responding to showings, answering questions, whatever, all those little things that take up time in our day that really we don't have to do, right? An executive assistant can do that. That's number one. The second rung on the ladder, so one up from it, is delivery. So that onboarding people, setting up any kind of accounts, um, getting everything on MLS, right? Delivering um, contracts to close correctly, past client follow-up, your 60 touch systems, um, you know, making sure that you promise the best service with the least amount of hassle that that's happening, right? So number two is delivery, those systems. The third part on the replacement ladder is marketing. This is making sure our pipeline is full, right? We, we are in a pipeline business. That's really what we are. We're a pipeline business. And we need to make sure that at, it's not feast and famine, feast and famine, right? We want to make sure that we have somebody dedicated to keeping our pipeline full. Now, that could be as simple as it, it's called marketing. It could be making sure our marketing is consistent. It could be somebody that's handling it for you. It could be a system that every time we get a new listing, these 30 things happen to make sure that it's marketed to the most amount of people possible, right? So I'm not saying this always has to be a person. It's just the rungs of the ladder. So it's kind of like, call it, I call it executive assistant, but call it like admin -y stuff, delivery, marketing, and now number four is sales. So maybe you're at a point where you're doing a lot of business on your own and you can afford to take a piece of the commission from someone else in terms of you're giving them the client, but you're making commission because you're adding value to them as well, right? So team, we all know what teams are. Could be something like that. Could be somebody that, you know, people get ISAs, could be something like that. But sales is the next step of the ladder. A lot of times agents like to go from zero to number four, sales, and they're hiring ISA and they're like, I just hate prospecting. I just hate it. I hate it. So I'm going to hire someone to do it. And my first question is, okay, great. Um, how many leads do you have in your database? How old are they and where'd they come from? And generally the answer is, well, you know, I, I don't know. I probably have like 700 or maybe a thousand or maybe even 2000. And I'm like, okay, great. Hire an ISA for one day. 
and they'll be through that list. And then they're going to be staring at you going, what do I do now? Because I can't call them every single day for the next 60 days, right? So you have to be at a point where you can outsource that. So, so I actually heard someone um, on stage at, a, at an event that said, my very first, if I was starting over in real estate today, the first hire I would make would be an ISA. And I was like, oh my gosh, I just totally don't agree with that. And this is why, the replacement ladder. All right, number five, leadership. Leadership is really slow. So now what we're looking for is strategy, right? So maybe it is a director of operations now. Maybe it is a consultant or again, coach in your business, somebody that's helping you elevate to leadership. Your job is now new business development for your company, like making sure that we have a full pipeline through other sources. And so now leadership becomes the game. So that uh, that's the five rungs of that replacement ladder. So just to kind of bring it all back together, the easiest way to implement this by the end of the year is to start with the time and energy audit and be honest with yourself. What is it that you love about your job? It's not going to be everything. I, I heard recently that, you know, we think we should be motivated and excited and love every piece of our job 100% of the time, right? Or we should be looking for something else, right? Like YOLO and all that stuff. When actually, it's, what we're looking for is 51%. We're looking for you to be 51% feeling great, motivated to do that activity. That's why they say businesses are built on boring work because nobody wakes up every day and they're like, oh my gosh, I cannot wait to talk to that seller and have him rip me a new one today because his house didn't sell. Oh, this is, this is the greatest industry ever. And tomorrow when that one closes, I'm unemployed again. Oh my gosh. No vacation time, pay 401k. I got it going on. Nobody, no one says that. But we feel like we should be this like excited and motivated. We should love every piece of it and don't let anybody know that we're struggling. Not the case. So do the time and energy audit, especially now when we're coming into the winter season and determine what things do you need in your business? Let, let's say you're like, Stacey, I sold 50% less homes than I did last year and I don't have income. Like there's no income, it's drying up. Then don't look at it as a people problem and look at it like a system or automation problem using what you already have. So you all have a CRM. Get in there and learn it like you've got to teach it December 31st. And I promise you, you'll be like, I didn't know it did that. Or, oh my gosh, I was only using 50% of the capability. Okay, if you're only using 50%, get to 55%, right? We're not looking for you to like own KV Core here in 2024, but utilize what you've got and make it a little bit better. Your, your Zoom link is like atomic habit. So you guys all know, right? 1% better every day. And so that's what you're looking for. You're looking to utilize your time better you're learning to show up better in your relationships. You're looking to use what you've got and not just throw money at it. And then start to treat yourself like a true CEO. Most realtors are just self-employed. They're not business owners. But this call is different. You guys can show up as business owners by doing these things. These are what eight, nine-figure company CEOs, this is what they do. These, this is the process that they go through. But in real estate, sometimes we just, we get so busy because there's a lot thrown at us. The time and energy audit is like a really great place to start. And I hope you do read the book and you'll start to realize, oh my gosh, I remember she said that, or, you know, I've heard this before, but not in the way, you know, this is talked about. So I think it gives us a great framework in which to build off of. So that's what I've got for you about leverage. So awesome. Stacey, um, how many, actually, before I ask this question, how many people in here are less than three years in the industry? Raise your hand if you're less than three years in the industry. 
Okay, if you're Tom, you are not. <laughs> See a couple. How many of you guys are five years or more? Okay, wow, we've I've got pretty good um, across the board. So, Stacy, if you know, if, if you've got agents that are ten years in the business, and you have agents that are maybe just in their first year in the business, um, I feel like that could be different advice um, for their stages of where they're at. So for a newer agent in the industry, just less than three years in, what would you recommend maybe just the first one or two things that they do to start leveraging their time? Because right now, a lot of them are going to just be in that phase of I'm doing everything. So what would be just the first one or two steps you would recommend they take? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's acknowledging that you are in the beginning stages of your business. So you are going to have to do everything, but you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you do it. So even using the camcorder method with how you document things and then using AI to write it. So, okay, when I take a listing, here's the 15 things that happen. Okay, once it hits MLS, here's the next 15 things, right? Because part of, Part of running everything yourself is that your mental mind space is taken up by all these minuscule things. Like no one thinks anymore how to brush your teeth, but we know it all needs to be done. Like we all know that. So that's what we're trying to get to by documenting things. So that way, when someone calls you and they're like, hi, I'd like to talk to you about selling my home. You're like, oh, uh, okay, great. Yes. I'll, I will be there on Tuesday. And then you did no homework up front because you forgot to ask them all the questions. You forgot to ask them, you know, what they wanted for the house. You can't show up with an appointment. Now you're two stepping or three stepping and you just look like a loaf. So show up like a business owner in your own business. I always tell people to look at it. Like if you're a board of directors of your company, would your board of directors, if they opened up your calendar, would they know you're in business? Or would they be like, does this guy even sell real estate? I don't even see an appointment on his calendar. I don't see any prospecting time. I don't see any time networking. I don't see any time following up. I don't see any admin work time. I don't even know what he's doing, right? So think of yourself that way. Like if I opened up, you know, a, a CEO's calendar, it'd be probably, if it was a successful company, it'd be probably pretty, pretty blocked, right? With time. And even if your time block is, you know, researching the market, this is when I take appointments, you know? So as a new agent, you have to know your business and create a business. And you can do that simply by, by auditing what you're doing. And again, making sure that you're not reinventing the wheel all the time. Yeah. So I know that um, when you and I were talking, Stacy, about this particular topic, one of the ahas, and this would be for a lot of you agents that are maybe five years or more in the business, if you've ever kind of hit that wall at 80 miles an hour, or you feel like you're hitting that burnout stage, he talks in the book about, um, there's kind of three different, you know, they talk about um, stages of grief. Well, there's also stages of mm -hmm. Uh, burnout, right? And so he goes through, sometimes you feel like you need to sell the company out of desperation to relieve the pain. Uh, sometimes you feel like you need to stall the company, right? That's where you just admit like, gosh, maybe it's better if I have a smaller company. Um, and the third one was sabotage. So you self-sabotage the company by, you know, whether you fire people for minuscule things or, um, but you know, you, you just find ways to inadvertently relieve pain because you've hit that, that pain line. So for those people, Stacy, cause they, that's a, just a different stage of the business. What would you recommend the one or two things for those agents? I, I think we tend to make it complicated and it is the same thing. I think it's the same framework because no matter what stage you're in, you're probably still doing things that you shouldn't you're still getting caught up in busy work. You're still making excuses for, you know, not doing something. Maybe you're starting to hide because you're like not feeling great. And you're like, I don't know. I just feel so unmotivated, right? And we're, the, the key to anything is honestly action, right? It's just taking a step. I mean, without diving into 
everyone's business. You can't truly prescribe what it is for them. So that's why these frameworks work so well. So if they do the audit, transfer, fill, audit, transfer, fill, you will have a true business. Now, if you're like, give me one thing that I can do at, at an advanced stage to make sure that I'm running my business like a business, that would be know your economic model and get your numbers in order. So if you're not looking at a P&L of your business, even if you're a single agent or you have a team or you've been in the business one year or 20 years, if you're not looking at a monthly P&L and you don't understand what your expense buckets are and where they should be, that would be a really great step. So let me give you a quick little, how do I look at a P&L and know if I'm in the right realm, okay? So you take your G total GCI, okay? So the total number before brokerage split, before you're paying anybody else, it's that top line number, okay? Your expenses go into three buckets. It's people, marketing and advertising, and general. So everything else, okay? Each of those buckets, should be ideally no more than 10% of your GCI total. So people cost should be no more than 10%. You could go up to 12, keep it at 10 or below. Marketing, this is marketing, advertising, all those things we do. That expense, no more than 10% of the total GCI. Everything else, dues, um, postage, office supply, everything else, 10% of total GCI. If you do that, your net, now your net is the number that you can use to pay yourself. So whether you're on a commission split yourself, where you're just paying yourself directly from the commissions, or you're paying yourself a salary, that net number tells you if you have a healthy profit or not. And when you're in the business that when you're the main one making the sales and you don't have a team, that number needs to be above 50%, that net. When you have team members and you've got commission split, you want it somewhere between 25 to 35% is your net of GCI. But just concentrate on GCI and the three buckets, 10, 10, 10, or total expenses, 30% of GCI. If you're over that, make adjustments, especially in this kind of real estate environment. Awesome. I want to leave just a second here for any questions that anybody has. Um, oh, Stacy's posting a document in there um, that can help. Yes. Yeah. So I created this document a long time ago um, before reading this book, but it was like, what could an admin do for me or someone, right? And so this is just a document I created called admin versus agent things to do. So you can have it, if you want to make edits to it, just click file, make a copy. Otherwise you just have view access and it just gets you starting to think. This also helps you with your time and energy audit. You could circle this in red and green and dollar signs and see what you're doing because somebody's doing these things or most of them. So it's kind of another list to help you. I love that. Always good to not have to start from scratch and it makes you think of other things when you're reading through the list that are maybe specific to you. Um, all right. Any other questions you guys have for Stacy while she is here? If not, I'm going to let her, uh, wrap this up. And I think Tom may also have some quick little announcements as well. I, I don't know about you guys, but if I could go back in my career and have known this information, man, I feel like this would be just a game changer for if you're at the beginning of getting in, you know, it, being in the real estate realm or, if you've been in it for 15, 20 years, like Stacy and I, right? Like this is, um, this is game changing advice. The, the frameworks that, that she's sharing. So hopefully you guys took away a good amount of value from this today. And, um, I don't see any questions here popping into the, into the chat. So Stacy, you just, you answered them all. You've solved the world's problems and we are good. <laughs> awesome. awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Stacy, Andrea. Well, this Friday, uh, we have Derek Shank. He's one of the top coaches in the country, and he's going to finish. He's going to share how to finish strong in 2023. You know what day it is today? It's November 1st. We've got two months to finish strong to set ourselves up 
for 2024. And don't forget, we have the business planning clinic on November the 16th. We're flying in the best of the best uh, workmen to Roseville. That's the 16th. So check that out. Be there as well. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Stacey. Andrea, have a good day. Bye, everybody. See you all later. Thank you. Bye.